For the Falkland Islands, nature and wildlife holds a strong sense of national pride. Its native flora and fauna is intertwined in the country's heritage, with its beauty also being an attraction to overseas visitors. But awe-inspiring as it is, the natural beauty of these islands has to be increasingly protected. Over the years, the introduction of non-native species from abroad has been a cause for concern. Alien species, like this gorse behind me, are organisms that have been introduced from outside an area and become problematic for the natural environment. Added to this, they usually reproduce with ease, making them hard to control. This can have negative impacts on native species and habitats, but can also affect humans with impacts such as damage to property or agriculture. It is estimated that the direct impacts of invasive species and their management cost the global economy billions of US dollars annually, with the cost to the European Union alone equating to around £11 billion a year, according to data sourced by the International Union for Conservation of Nature in 2018. In the Falkland Islands, the Califati bush was originally introduced from South America for wind protection several decades ago. But since then, the plant has created problems for sheep farmers by invading the prime productive land and outcompeting native grasses. Richard Stevens moved to Port Sussex in 1984 and has since farmed the land. But after arriving, the Califati, which was once very sparse, has spread throughout the farm and now causes issues for his livelihood, which is centred on sheep farming depending on how long the, the sheep are actually around the farm, which is where m most of our contamination is, um, the more they get contaminated. We try and have the sheep in paddocks away from the shearing shed to keep them away from the caliphate, but as time goes on that becomes more and more difficult because there's more and more caliphate. And what sort of impact does the, does the caliphate have on wool farming specifically for you? Does it have a sort of economic impact? On it, it does t to a degree. Um, so you, you have your A, B and C wool, A being the best, and then you have double A, double B and double C, which means there's something um, like it's contaminated with caliphate it could be other things like there's there's a break in the staple or it, it's dirty so when you have a year of a lot of caliphate you you're downgrading your wall into the the double category so you'll be losing money um fr from that uh, from that bale of wool if you walk along all these fences these fences that we've, we've built, you'll see that the caliphate is thicker where these little birds sit on the fence and deliver the seeds. Every single post you think, oh well this one has, hasn't got it, but yeah, here. And what is the extent to how far this sort of spreads in, in this sort of area? A couple of miles. Mm. Through, here, through the other side of Hell's Kitchen, which is the main feature on, on the farm. It's a numbers game. If you think that every berry has nine seeds and like a decent bush has probably got a thousand berries, <laughs> or let's say a couple of hundred, yeah. uh, you're talking about millions of, of seed every, every year. When you're talking about those sort of numbers, what can you actually do to manage or, or is, how do you mitigate against that sort of risk? Yeah, well, for, for us, we just have to manage our paddocks and, and it, it is a problem because as time goes on, we, we, we keep our sheep here while we're shearing and, and then we have to drive them through the caliphate to the shearing shed, but that's the only way that we can keep them relatively caliphate free. Yeah. But again, it makes it harder and harder when you've got to drive them further and further when the shearing operations at the, at the shearing shed. Yeah. Although the spread of Kalafazi has got worse over the years, it is an area that the government has looked at and made attempts to manage. In 2015-16, to 16, for example, 
the Department of Agriculture and Environmental Planning Department conducted trials to help identify the best herbicides to get rid of the caliphate. But it wasn't until 2017 that the government's executive council decided to grant a total of £165,000 to manage caliphate on Port Sussex over four years. The Exco paper highlighted the harm associated with the plant, including the risk that it caused to both protecting the environment and economic development, which were important areas of priority within the government's island plan. It outlined how the presence of caliphate displaced native species and changed habitat composition whilst also having a negative impact on the sustainability of agricultural industries, in turn decreasing land productivity and value. In response, the money granted by Exco went towards the purchase of herbicides and the enlisting of professional help from New Zealand to help with plant spraying on the farm. But while the investment did help at the time, Richard now feels that the government's focus has slowly been shifting from the management of Caliphate, and he fears that the problem could get worse if it is left unchecked. The decision has been made in the past that it was an important enough issue to have funding. Um, and I, I think about six months ago, there was a really strong response from the MLAs who, who I think nearly every one of them spoke about, you know, trying to control caliphate. And, and, you know, the decision's been made, a lot of money's been spent. You know, why not? carry on with that focus and get the job done rather than, you know, drift away slightly and eventually lose all that money and all that effort for, uh, for absolutely nothing. It just seems, seems a waste, a shame. It is unlikely that Caliphate will ever be eradicated from the Falklands, so the aim now is to bring levels down to a point where it can be managed by landowners to prevent further spread. This will limit future economic and environmental impacts that Caliphate has within the islands. But while Caliphate has impacted the Falklands negatively, it has also served as a lesson for how other invasive species can be managed. Falkland Island's government currently invests money into tackling other types of invasive plant to ensure that their impact is reduced. Ken Passfield runs Island Landcare, an environmental consultancy that has been contracted by the government to undertake habitat restoration work. Currently, the focus of his work has been on the control of invasive weeds, which have been sited across areas of Stanley Common. He sprays herbicide over infected areas, targeting invasive plant species such as gorse, spear thistle, creeping thistle and caliphate. A lot of weeds, they might sit in the Falklands or anywhere for 50, 60 years. They spread very slowly at first, especially cold places like here, they get acclimatised to the conditions. It's called the lag phase and suddenly they come out of the lag phase, they're better uh, better acclimatised to local conditions and that's it. They start expanding much more rapidly than they have done. And I think from what we've seen recently, certainly gorse is coming, is, is it in that category now. Gorse was one of the first plants to be imported to the Falklands from Europe in the 1800s, 
when it was primarily used as cattle fencing and shelter. But gorse is now considered an invasive threat to areas where it no longer holds a productive agricultural use. This is because it reduces access to areas and can become a home to pests such as hares and rats. But to manage the spread, Ken sprays gorse and other weeds with a selective type of non-toxic herbicide. This ensures that only the weeds are killed while the native grasses are left intact. Over the years, Ken has been reducing the amount of herbicide that he uses, which indicates that the numbers of invasive weed have been decreasing. But although this may be promising, it is unlikely that the weeds will ever be eradicated. You're never going to eradicate gorse from the Falklands. You're not going to get every single last seedling. I mean, unless if it's on people's private land, that's their choice to have it there. So yeah, a gorse, uh, weed work sorry, is more about control rather than complete eradication. You can only say you've completely eradicated something, you know, if there's just one individual turns up, you spray it before it sets seed and it dies. That's an eradication. Uh, generally, weed work, there is much more of an ongoing issue to it than you'd have with uh, something like a rat eradication. But over time, as you do, once you've got the cover down, you know, once you've got the amount down, there's a lot of work in the first few years, and then after that your work decreases, but you just have to keep going over, you know, checking for outliers, checking for regrowth. Um, so it's, it's quite, it's, it's an investment first up, and then after that it's, it requires fewer resources, but you've got to keep at it. The fact that some invasive species are so difficult to eradicate means that a financial burden indefinitely rests on the government for their management and control. This is one reason why the government enforces such heightened levels of biosecurity at the country's various ports. Procedures such as foot bathing and luggage inspections reduce the chances of any foreign species reaching the islands. But while these are good preventative measures against invasive species, there must also be opportunities to bolster native ecosystems and wildlife. The Environmental Studies Budget is a scheme that has been running for around two decades and was first implemented by FIG to help Falkland Islanders promote, conserve and protect biodiversity. As part of the scheme, local individuals and organisations submit proposals for environmental projects. The scheme then awards funding for projects centred on different priority areas such as biodiversity protection and the restoration of habitats. Fryn Ross was a recipient of this funding in 2020 and used the grant to fence off a 45 hectare wildlife area at Blue Beach Farm. This permanently excluded livestock from the area, which allowed threatened habitats the chance to recover from grazing. The resilience comes from um, a diversity of species and, and for example our wildlife area up up the Wild Ridge has, has quite a diversity of species and, and I believe strongly that that helps us to um, resist the invasion of invasive species. Of course, you know, some species are very strong and they can grow anywhere but, but um, where you've got kind of bare areas or eroded areas then they're very vulnerable to invasion by um, species which, um, which grow fast and spread easily which is, tends to be invasive species. So. Um, so I think the ESB funding by indirectly by promoting native species and supporting those helps to um, keep the level of the um, invasive species lower but only in those particular areas obviously. <laughs> With the help of local charity Falklands Conservation, Fryn was also able to establish a separate wildlife area on the farm in 2019. It was thought that by introducing native plants like tussock and managing the spread of gorse and calafati, native wildlife would be encouraged to return to the area, thereby helping to restore the farm from previous grazing activities. Falklands plants and animals aren't adapted to live with um, sheep or cattle because th there's no native mammalian grazers here, just geese. So um, these little wildlife areas give a kind of an island sort of refuge where, where um, species that um, have a hard time surviving with a lot of grazing um, can flourish. We weren't sure if tussock would survive very well here because it's quite dry and it's quite, um, there's not too much, although it looks like it today, but there's not too much um, kind of salt water. But these ones have done quite well, so um, we were really pleased. It was a nice surprise and um, they're good. You can see kind of tussock doing its thing of laying down its leaves which is a good way of trapping carbon and they provide shelter and there's been some small ones which have grown from them so they've seeded a bit so that was really great and um, 
yeah, a bit of habitat for wildlife. Other than that, we introduced some flowering plants. So partly for aesthetic reasons, just because I like them, but also because um, they're really good for the insects. So, um, well, all the invertebrates. A lot of these species mm. are really not, some of them are not found out anywhere else on earth mm. and some of them are not mm. common outside of the Falklands. So we're a kind of haven for those species. And um, if we lose them from here, they'll be gone from everywhere, which just leaves the world a poorer place, doesn't it? <laughs> it is hoped that with small initiatives like this, members of the public can be encouraged and supported to protect Falklands wildlife. In this way, local people gain a sense of stewardship for their land and can be empowered to nurture the environment through smaller actions. On a small level, um, we can you might just have a few native plants in your garden but you show them to people and talk about them and you can share them you know when they set seed you can share them and maybe take them out to a farm or a, um, there's new nature areas coming up all the time so um, and you can kind of at the garden centre you can buy native plants and the more demand there is for them the more perhaps those will be sold rather than non-native so um, I think kind of living how you how you want things to be you know um, taking those practical actions is important and th and then also keeping political pressure on and um, you know do, doing what you can in that regard. <laughs> The chance of introducing new invasive species continues to remain a risk. New routes for international travel and trade will provide opportunities for different species to get here. However, with the right preventative measures, investment and public knowledge, it is possible to manage the impacts effectively. But there must also be a will for action, and for that action to be taken sooner rather than later.